ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies. I was telling people, and I'm going to tell you guys, so we're going to have a conversation. Is that okay with you? Now, those of you who don't know me, we're going to have one of those conversations, those deep conversations, so you don't have to stay around. You're going to learn something, I guarantee you, because I had one person said that I was an agent. Yeah, that's right. Something like an FBI agent. I. <laughs> I'm sorry. Whew. Lord, have mercy. It's hilarious. I told you guys about how they've placed me inside a facility four times since 2004. Four times. Taking at least six years of my life away those four times since 2004. But I'm an agent. Isn't that interesting? Well, anywho, ladies and gentlemen, they will be coming my way again. I'm certain of it because, as I told some of you before, just like I knew the last time, I know this time. This time I don't have to be quiet. What they came at me for the last time, they didn't have, there was no crime. They know there was no crime. That's why the appeals court overturned it. Even though I remained silent, I remained silent because the understanding, and I can only call it an understanding, from the God that I serve, his name is Jehovah, my best friend, my God, my friend, my king, my lord, my blah, blah, blah. I can go on and on and on with the accolades. He told me what I was going to have to endure. The same as he told Paul what Paul would have to, well, Jesus told Paul what Paul would have to endure for his name's sake. Go ahead. John was the latter part of the eighth chapter of John. Well, no, actually the beginning of the eighth chapter, not the latter part. The latter part is about that, that unit character. But the beginning of the eighth chapter Paul is on that road to Damascus, and he told him what he needed to do, and he told him the things he must suffer for his name. I'm going to have to suffer, and it's okay. I'm fine with that. Look, let me go ahead and let you guys know the scoop. When I was released this last time, I was promised peace. I've had peace. Go ahead. Go back and listen to the videos. I've not had one problem. My health has not been a problem. Yeah, I've had some issues, but they've not been no major issues. They've just been regular wear and tear. Okay? I've had my peace. That's what I asked him for. I just did a video today talking about waking up in the morning and being at peace. Okay? I've had my peace. And I didn't put that in there. With this conversation in mind, I put that in there because I realized that I, again, for several times, that I got what I asked for. He gave me peace. Go ahead. Go back and listen to all my videos. You guys know I talk about what goes on in my life, and you haven't heard me really talking about any major disasters in my life. I have problems just like everybody else, but you don't hear me talking about no major issue. So... We have to educate you guys on something. Would you like to have a little bit of an education? Now, I have not planned this. I've talked about it before with at least one group of people. As a matter of fact, I did research on something with that very same group of people. We can go all the way down here because that's where we need to be at the end. Because you got to go to the end to find out where you began. And what we're going to do is we simply going to do this. Wake up. Wake up. Warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause. Stop listening. You guys know the Fifth Amendment. It says no warrant shall issue. The very first words is very important when you get to... This is what I mean by the very first words. Pay attention now, because you need to pay attention. This is important. Forget about the papers and properties and effects and all of that stuff. That's not important. Okay? No warrants with an S. That means no matter what the issue is. Doesn't matter if it's a civil warrant or a criminal warrant. Okay? Doesn't matter. No warrants shall issue... So they have to be issued from someone, not the police. The police don't issue warrants. They serve warrants. So they don't issue them. 
So who issues warrants? The government, usually the courts. The administrative agencies can issue a warrant as well, so just keep that in mind. However, no warrant, doesn't matter what type of warrant it is, no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause. Oh, yeah, he's probably guilty. Yeah, I met that mother. No, uh-uh, because I didn't see what he done. Y'all, see, y'all don't know him like I know him. See, that that's probable cause. He's probably guilty. So let's find out what probable cause means. Y'all don't mind? Because, I mean, you hear the word all the time. The courts even talk about a probable cause hearing. You hear the word all the time. So let's do L-E-G-A-L-D-E-F-I-N-I-T-I. Got to make sure I hit the right button. I thought I hit that one because my fingers, they big, y'all. Legal definition of probable cause. Probable cause exists where the police. No, sorry. It's not the police. Ladies and gentlemen. The police don't get to determine probable cause, ever. Where the police has reasonable, trustworthy information sufficient to warrant a reasonable person to believe a particular person has committed or is committing an offense. That's a lie. The police cannot do that. That's called a presumption, not probable cause. Probable cause refers to a reasonable basis for believing that a crime may have been committed for an arrest. Or that evidence of a crime is present. Okay. Pay attention. Probable cause. Probable cause to search exists when facts and circumstances known to law enforcement officers provide a basis for a reasonable... No. It doesn't. Police officers cannot determine probable cause. Hold on. Oh, and they're going to talk about the Fourth Amendment? Let's go ahead and have them talk about it. Neither the Fourth Amendment nor the federal statutory provisions relevant to the area outlines probable cause. <laughs> so we're going to go here because this is Justia, named after a pagan god. That's the name for a pagan god, ladies and gentlemen. Justia. This is the Lady Justice, the pagan goddess Justice. That's the name. But it says probable cause, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. No warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath and affirmation. Whoa, there must be an affidavit or a declaration. That's why you have in some states, they have indictments or information. The information is an affidavit. There must be an affidavit. It cannot be pay attention. It cannot just be a witness statement. The witness statement must be under oath. The witness statement must be in an affiant capacity. Affidavit. Don't believe me. Supported by oath or affirmation. So the probable cause needs to be supported. It can't sit by itself. It needs to have support. Okay, let's get this straight. Pay attention. The concept of probable cause, it's not a concept. It's not a concept. It's an actual constitutionally protected and secured right. The concept of probable cause is central to the meaning of the warrant clause. Because it says no warrant shall issue. That's the clause in the contract. The warrant clause. Neither the Fourth Amendment nor federal statutory provisions relative to the area define probable cause. And they don't define it, but probable cause is already defined. Let's prove this. The definition is entirely a judicial construct. Actually, no, it isn't. See, the Constitution didn't have to pay attention, didn't have to define it. Probable cause. That means they must have just cause for making the arrest. They can't just do it on a whim. They must have witnessed something. There must be an eyewitness. Somebody must be saying, I witnessed it, and they must do it under oath. Well, guess what police officers can't do? <laughs> they can't take oaths. Go ahead. I dare you to find somewhere in any law where the police officers can take somebody's oath. Only a magistrate can take someone's oath. Go ahead. Every ceremony where somebody signs an oath of office, there's usually a magistrate present.
When it comes to the courts, there's always a magistrate or a judge present when an oath is given. All right, raise your right hand. Okay, repeat after him. Do you solemnly blah, 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 blah. Ladies and gentlemen, oath or affirmation. Now let's continue just for a second. We are concerned only with the question whether the affiant, pay attention, had reasonable grounds at the time of his affidavit for the belief that the law was being violated on the premises to be searched. And if the apparent facts set out in the affidavit are such that a reasonable, discreet, and prudent man would be led to believe that there was a commission of an offense charged, there is probable cause justifying the issuance, pay attention, justifying the issuance of a warrant. Hmm. Pay attention. I want y'all to pay attention because many of y'all don't know this. So bear with me. Only judges issue warrants. So let's go back and read this to see what they're saying in this particular court case. In determining what is probable cause, we are concerned only with the question as to whether the affiant testimony had reasonable grounds at the time of his affidavit, his sworn testimony, for the belief that the law was being violated on the premises to be searched. And if the apparent facts set out in the affidavit are such that a reasonable, discreet, and prudent man, pay attention, judges nor police officers are reasonable or discreet. Go back and look at when enforcing statutes, how a judicial officer cannot use their rationale, reason, or their own discretion. They have to go according to the dictates of the agency. Administrative Law 101. Supreme Court just overturned that junk. They, they just turned that junk on its head. Y'all be careful because it's coming. Would be led to believe that there was a commission of the offense charge. There is probable cause to justify the issuance of a warrant. Probable cause is to be determined according to the factual and particular considerations of everyday life on which the reasonable and prudent man, not the legal technicians, act. Warrants are favored in the law, and their use will not be thwarted by hypothetical reading of a supporting affidavit, supporting testimony. For the same reason, reviewing courts will accept evidence of less judicial, competent, and persuasive character than would have justified an officer in acting in his own without a warrant. No, but that's what the court said before. But I want you to understand, an affidavit is testimony. Testimony can only be presented to a judge. Can't present testimony to an officer. An officer is not qualified to receive testimony. Okay? The courts will sustain the determination of probable cause so long as there is a substantial basis for the magistrate to conclude that there was probable cause. Police officers cannot determine probable cause. See, the reason why police officers can't determine probable cause is because once police officers determine probable cause, they become the judge. And then they can make a determination right then and there. And that's it. That's why, pay attention, you have to have a probable cause hearing. Okay, you have to have a probable cause hearing. There has to be a hearing. Now, you guys do understand that, right? So let me make sure we get it to your understanding. An affidavit is testimony. When the police go to the prosecutor and they go to the judge to get a warrant because the prosecutor, the police, and the judge meet and the judge asks them questions, that's called a hearing. But you're not present but they have your address, but you're not present, but they had a hearing. It's called an ex parte hearing. Many of you have seen the young Doe trial where the court had an ex parte hearing without any of the defense attorneys being present or any of the defendants being present, but a witness was present, the prosecution was present, the judge was present. That's called an ex parte hearing. You don't believe me? Go back and listen to the attorney talk about that and talked about how illegal it was. Every single case where a warrant is issued for somebody's arrest, where the police 
go and arrest somebody saying, we have a warrant for your arrest. And what do you mean you have a warrant for my arrest and you get that surprise? Okay, that undue surprise is illegal. They're not allowed to get a warrant without first attempting to locate you and give you a heads up. Hey, uh, you need to come to court or there's going to be a warrant issued for your arrest. You guys have heard when police have said that to you, huh? Pay attention. Even the judge says, if you don't show up, a warrant will more than likely be issued for your arrest. They're letting you know, people, that we're going to give you an opportunity to be here and hear what's going on. No warrant shall issue unless put upon probable cause. Probable cause requires an affiant, a declarant, somebody who's going to sit up there and say, oh, yeah, I saw him do it, Your Honor. Yeah, I'm a snitch, but that's him right there. Mm -hmm. Right there. Right. No, no, that one right there. You see who I'm pointing at. Yeah, I don't care if he's your brother. That's him. Okay. That's probable cause. We have so many people in jail right now because they didn't understand what probable cause was and their attorneys are prohibited by law from telling them. Their attorneys are prohibited by law from telling them. Supreme Court sits up here and makes it seem like an officer could have reasonable suspicion. No, the officer doesn't get to have reasonable suspicion. There's no such thing in law as reasonable suspicion. Probable cause does not deal with suspicion. But they call you a suspect for a reason. Suspect mean you are suspicious. Yes, he was uh, performing some suspicious activity. Suspicious activity? You hear people say, well, that's not a crime. Wait, are you calling me a suspect? Really? Based on what? What's your evidence? Okay, well, let's go to the magistrate right now. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no need. Let's cut to the chase. Let's go right to the magistrate, and you can present your case to the magistrate, and I can be there to rebut your stupidity. See, that's the way it's supposed to happen, but it doesn't happen. Imagine that. Now, look, hold on. I've uh, attempted to raise this argument. I don't like the word argument, and I, I hesitated there for a reason because I was trying to figure which word would be most appropriate in trying to explain that I have attempted to bring this issue up and every single time they've denied me my right to an appeal. I've attempted to bring it up in court cases and every single time they've ignored me. Let me make sure you understand they won't ignore me no more. I'm going scorched earth. I told you this was the year of the lawsuit. I am going scorched, 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 scorched earth. I am going to, you think, forest fires and grass fires or something. I'm going scorched earth. I am not holding back. I am going to put their secrets right out there in front of them every single time. That's why I said they want to play with me. I'm going to play back this time, and I'm not holding back. See, you know what I noticed? And I'm going to say this because I was just talking to someone, and I was thinking about this earlier today. There's not a single person who's ever watched any of my videos who didn't learn something. I guarantee you, there is not a single person who's ever watched any of my videos who did not learn something. Now, I'm not going to say you learn something every single video, but I guarantee you there's not a single person who's ever watched any of my videos who did not learn something. Why? Because I have experience. Experience in what? Experience in just about everything. I done been through way too much. I used to tell people I've been through more in my lifetime than an 80-year-old man goes through in his entire lifetime. And I really have. Many of you, if you listen to my videos, you'll see I've been through a whole lot. And I say a whole lot. And I haven't even told you guys half the story. I only told you guys some of the stuff. But don't worry about it. We'll, we'll have time in the future to talk. I want to sit here and tell you guys everything that's about to happen. But I can't. I am prohibited. Yes, I'm aware of what's getting ready to happen next. That's how I know how close I am. And, but I can't. The only thing I can say is those of you who pay attention and will be around, my channel's not going anywhere. If YouTube is still there, then I will be back. No, for right now, I'm okay. Nothing's happening tomorrow. Nothing's happening next week. Nothing's happening immediately. But there will come a time in the future where I will have to, and I will either by no choice or by choice stop doing videos. And it's going to be a wow. And it won't be because I choose to. It's going to be because I literally have no other choice. Now, I say that because there's a reason. There's an art to the madness and a reason behind the statement. 
So we'll just leave it there for now so that I can move on with the next thing that I need to tell you guys about. Because, like I said, pay attention. I have my 1096s here. I place my EIN on each of these. You can choose whether to do your 1096 as the sole proprietorship uh, with the social security number or an EIN. I'd rather do it straight business because it's strictly business, EPMD. I'd rather do it straight business. So I have them here. I'm going to do 10 tonight. That's just a 1096 because it's writing and I don't have a lot of, you know, time to be writing. So I'm going to do these 10 and then I'm going to finish the 1098s, uh, the 1099s tomorrow, 1099Cs. Oh, I have a stack of them. I've been planning this for a while. And all of them will be for the full amount of $400 billion. And pay attention. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach a copy of the proof of service and the front page of the lawsuit, letting them know that the lawsuit has been filed. Okay. Now, I'm going to pause you guys for a second because I have an alarm going off. And I said I was going to straighten up that camera. So give me a second. Oh, and by the way, no, there are no problems with my cameras. All my cameras work. They work perfect. There ain't nothing going on with the cameras. Just in case anybody says, well, the cameras weren't working. Okay. Got it. Give me a second. Okay. Made some adjustments to two of the cameras to get some better angles and to keep the other one from going off because it's sensitive. And so it worked. They're not going off anymore. And I can see. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, back to the lawsuit. And we'll finish talking about everything else as best I can before my earpiece uh, runs out of battery. What's happening, ladies and gentlemen, is by law, the IRC Section 166, if somebody owes you a debt, and they say it mostly applies to financial institutions, well, let's go and read that real quick, shall we? I wasn't planning on it, but let's do that. So we covered our probable cause so that you guys understand that. Those of you who need to know that information. I are, and see, a lot of people are afraid of the Internal Revenue Code. What for? Because they've trained you to be afraid. They want you to be afraid. Oh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be 166. IRC and 166. Okay, you'll see it says bad debts. That's that's all you need to know. So you know you're in the right section. Okay. Holy worthless debts. Holy cup mo well, anyway. There shall be allowed as a deduction any debt which becomes wholly worthless within the taxable year. Then you got carry forwards and carry back. So that's how that statement is not definitive. Let's continue here. Partially worthless debts, that means when satisfied that a debt is recoverable only in part, the secretary may allow such debts in an amount not to exceed the part charged off within a taxable years to be deductible. So pay attention. When they get debts that are charged off, it's a deduction for them. That means they receive a benefit. They get a tax break. That means that it, they have to adjust your account for the amount of the tax break, which means pay attention dollar for dollar. You guys are not stressing this. Let's continue. The amount of deduction for the purpose of subsection A, subsection A, whoa, holy worthless debts. The basis for determining the amount of deduction, well, I'm not asking for a deduction. I want the complete charge off and write off. For any bad debt shall be the adjusted basis provided in section 1011 for determining the loss from the sale or other disposition of property. Really? Okay, we're not going to go to 1011. Y'all can go to 1011. We're going to continue. We don't want to be repealed. Non-business bad debts, don't worry about non-business bad debts. We only worry about business bad debts. Oh, worthless security. This section shall not apply to debts 
which is evidenced by a security as defined in 165 G2C. Really? And then cross-reference for disallowance of deduction of worthless debts owned by political parties or similar organizations. See there. And for special rule for banks with respects to worthless securities. See this section. This is your section, ladies and gentlemen. The only thing you have to worry about, pay attention. I want you to pay attention. Oh, I got to go all the way up. Sorry. It's section A. That's the part that applies to you. When you have a worthless debt, it's right offable. Now, hold on. Let's make sure we can go IRC. I, well, no, we got, uh, we have to do chapter 11, USC. No, we don't, we're not going to do chapter 11. Well, let's do chapter 11, USC 541. 541. So that you guys can see this for yourself. This is the bankruptcy code. And this talks about property of the estate. Many people have lost their homes to foreclosure when they went through bankruptcy because they got a discharge and then they set up there and still took the home. They said because it was in rim. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you how that's a lie. The commencement of a case under section 301, 302, and 303, bankruptcy, chapter 11, chapter 7, chapter 13, of this title creates an estate. That's how your bankruptcy estate gets created. Such estate is comprised of all of the following property, whether or not it's located and by whomever or not it is held. Okay, what is located? Except it's provided in B, C2, down below of this section, all legal and equitable interests in the debtor's in property as of the commencement of the case is covered by bankruptcy. So yes, when you get a discharge, it includes all of your legal and equitable interest. That includes the property people. That includes in rem and otherwise. All legal, all equitable interests. That means it's all covered. That means they had no right to foreclose on you if they did. All right, we're gonna be right back with part two. I'm gonna have to splice this together because this earpiece is about to play out. So give me a second. Got it. You know, we're going to continue where we left off talking about the bad debt deductions and the state of the bankruptcy. I just wanted to say there have been people who have been trying to challenge my knowledge and trying to challenge my tenacity. Let's just say tenacity. That's the word for it because I am tenacious. But I told everybody that from the very beginning. And I, I don't buy into it and I don't bite when they do. And I'm hoping that that irritates them something serious okay here's the thing i don't advertise my videos you don't hear me talking about subscribe 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 hit like hit like please hit like i need to have those likes that that helps the algorithm why would i do that i'm giving information i'm not charging anybody for the information you're getting this for free information that you're not going to get any place else nobody else is going to talk about this stuff not until after i do because they're not interested in it they're interested in telling you something that'll make you go, ooh, wow. Oh, okay, there's a guy. Let, let's do this so that you guys understand. There's a guy who did a video who says that the, 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 the best position of a trust is the grantor. And people have watched that. And so they've come to us telling us, you guys made the Eon Foundation the grantor, and, 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 and we want to be the grantor. So make us the grantor. And I'm like, you ignorant mother. Okay, hold on now. Wake up. The grantor of a trust. Grantor of a trust. Trust relinquishes power. Once the trust is created. Stop listening. Now, we're going to go here to Investopedia. Now, I want you, want you guys to pay attention to what's going on here. I want you to pay attention to what they're saying because 
they're being very technical here, grantors' trust rules, what they are and how they work. What are grantors' trust rules? The grantors' intentions is law of the trust. Grantors' trust rules are guidelines contained in the Internal Revenue Code. Well, our trust, they are under 508, 509. That outlines certain tax implications for grantors' trust. These rules provide that the individual who creates a grantors' trust, our trusts are not grantors' trust, is recognized as the owner of the assets and property held in the trust for income and estate tax purposes because the grantor has possession of the property. The Eon Foundation has no possession of anybody's property. Our trusts are not grantors' trusts. Lord have mercy. Okay? Our trusts were never sold to anybody as grantors trust. So let me make sure you guys understand. It's called circular control. You can't be the trustee and the beneficiary, pay attention, and the grantor at the same time. That's called circular control. It will collapse the entire trust. Whew. I'm so glad we got that cleared up. Now, watch this. Wake up. An irrevocable trust. Stop listening. Our trust are irrevocable trust or irrevocable trust. I want you to pay attention. By creating an irrevocable trust, the grantor is releasing their control over the assets placed in the trust. Irrevocable trusts are administered by a trustee for the benefit of the trust beneficiaries. That's why our clients are the trustee and the beneficiary. But we had somebody argue with us. And I kept telling them, you don't know what you're talking about. I kept trying to explain it to the person. And they simply didn't get it because he knows more than I do. He's smarter than I am. He thought that we were trying to take his stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, none of you have anything that I want. I don't care if you had 300 quadrillion dollars sitting in your back pocket and you said, I'm going to get up from here. And whoever sits here can have anything I left. And you left the 400 quadrillion billion quadrillion dollars sitting right there. I promise you I would not get up to have that seat. As I explain to people all the time when we're walking and they see money on the ground, I say, I don't pick up money off the ground. I've walked over $100 bills. That's not me. I'm not that guy. I don't want your junk because I value other things. I don't value money. I don't care about it. Now, I don't, don't get me wrong. I don't just throw it away and just toss it out in the air like I did when I was a kid. Yes, I'm the guy who tells you they used to tear up $100 bills in half and throw it in the middle of the air and watch the little munchkins run after it. That was me. I did things like that, or I would just take money and put it in somebody's hand and say, there you go. What's this for? Does it have to be for anything? What, are you saying that I have to give you something for a reason? And people got to understand, that was just me. Whew. Oh, no, no. Mind you, the other day I had $200 in my pocket. And there was a homeless person. I was getting ready to walk over to him and give it to him. Okay? But like I said, I stayed in a homeless shelter on purpose several times because I wanted to see how the homeless live. By the way, I would stay at a homeless shelter eh, possibly... Maybe five years from now, I'll do it again. Not, not anytime soon. That experience is a unique experience, and I'm just not ready to do it again. I've done it at least eight times. But going to a homeless shelter, um, I'll go to a homeless shelter and just kick it and be with the people. I've done it many times. I met some very, very, very nice people in homeless shelters. Literally. Uh, people who I... Wish I, well, because of the homeless thing, they don't keep the phone numbers changed. And so I'm not able to keep in touch with many of them. But I really do wish I could get in touch with several of them. Because they are all, they were all to me, all right people, the ones that I met and the ones that I was communicating with. Well, anyway, let's get back to this.
trust thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we created a trust called the Mega Trust because it does allow for the trustee and beneficiary to have complete control of the trust so that there would be no argument about circular control. We were the grantor of the irrevocable trust. The trust makes it quite clear that it's irrevocable. And because it's an irrevocable trust means it cannot be changed or altered. We did that for our clients. We did that for our clients. Why? Because we wanted them to have control over their assets. Now, hold on. They don't have control over their assets, and neither do we. They gave us limited power of attorney to put together the trust so that it can gain control of their assets. How does the trust gain control of their assets? Well, that's where the bankruptcy comes in. We're doing some other paperwork in the background for them, and they do everything in the trust. They do everything. Look, ladies and gentlemen, you do everything to a nonprofit organization. You register your cars in your nonprofit organization, those of you who have these uh, mega trusts. Register all your property in your trust. All your properties in your trust. Our trust is seven trusts in one. Then they have another eight different aspects to them. Power of attorney, disaffirmance of minority. There are so many different things in the trust. And then we took out all of the case citations and added maxims of law so that nobody could call it a statutory trust. Now, hold on now. No, no, no. These are not just any trust. These are not your 501c3 trust. Oh, please. We wouldn't do that to you. These are nonprofit trusts to begin with. And that's why you receive a nonprofit organization in the name of the trust. The trust owns the, pay attention, the property. The trust owns the corporation. Everything's in the trust. You receive your two declarations for the micro and the mini. I mean, the micro, I'm sorry, I do need to say this. I've been wanting to say this to you guys so that you can understand. I'm, the mini trust, it's already structured. I just have to proofread it, and I've been so bombarded that I haven't had the opportunity. So I think I will give it to one of the staff members who this is what she does on a regular basis. I will give it to her to help me with because I, I have so much going on right now, I apologize. Now, remember, the mini trust, you have the micro trust, the mega trust, and the mini trust. Three trusts in one. The mini trust was never intended for you guys. I did it so people could add individuals, such as children or grandparents who have, you know, reached that point in life, or dogs and things like that. So this trust is your mini trust. You can put all your property in a mini trust because the micro trust controls it and the mega trust controls that micro trust and you control all of them because guess what you are the trustee of each of them it's the same as somebody creating three trusts and incorporating their property in the shorter smaller trust and then the second trust they incorporate the shorter smaller trust into and then they incorporate the second trust that has the shorter, smaller trust in it into the larger trust that holds everything. It's the same process, individuals, but what we're doing is we're doing it slightly different because we're going after the assets held in a minor account, which is held by the fiduciary. See, we've added a fiduciary and a trust protector. So there are five parties, five parties to this agreement then unlike all the other trusts out there, we've added an arbitration clause. Say what? An arbitration clause. That way, if there's any controversies, guess what? They got to go through arbitration. The arbitrator in the trust, you can change it to whomever you want. But by default, it's the Eon Foundation. Why? Just in case people don't want to choose the arbitrator, they choose Eon Foundation. By default, the Eon Foundation will just assign it to an arbitrator who will be unbiased. They will be told that they're to make a decision based on the facts, not based on feelings and emotions. That's even what the two arbitrations I'm getting ready to have with two people who decided that they wanted to mess with our account, ordering something and then canceling it after we started the work. Not going to play that. So we're going to do the arbitration. 
and we're going to put the facts up. And if we win, then we'll take these intelligent creatures to court based on the agreement that they signed. One person said, I didn't sign no agreement. You didn't sign no agreement. Let me show you guys what type of agreement people are signing every day that they don't even realize. Wake up. Click and slide or shrink wrap agreement. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, have you heard of a click and slide agreement? Well, when you click on a web browser, you click on a link, you click on that browser, and they have terms and conditions. They say, check out our terms and conditions below. You just accepted that agreement by using their website. That's why they tell you that. Any use of this website, you agree to blah, blah, blah. In the legal world, a click wrap agreement is more legally binding than a shrink wrap agreement. This is because a click wrap agreement requires the users to affirmatively agree to the terms and conditions of the agreement, while a shrink wrap agreement typically requires no action on the part of the user. So when you go to SACOM and you click on this and you click on that link and you click on that link, you are agreeing to the terms and conditions of the agreement. Now, hold on now. Read the agreement. The agreement doesn't take away any rights from you. It doesn't take away any rights from anybody. The only thing it does is requires the parties to be fair. I wrote it that way on purpose. Wrote it that way, man, almost seven years ago. And the reason why I did it that way, and it can't be touched, can't be amended. It's an irrevocable contract. Now, hold on now. This is what you guys don't understand. All of these companies that have these agreements, if the agreement is irrevocable, irrevocable, then that means that they cannot amend it. We cannot amend our agreement. Our agreement is our agreement. We cannot amend it. That's why we had to make sure that it was as fair as possible, because if somebody used it against us, we're up uh, bending these creeks. We don't control the arbitrator. Nobody ever controls an arbitrator. An arbitrator is free to make a determination based on the facts, and if they fail to go by the facts, they can be prosecuted. They could actually end up in jail. Being an arbitrator is no joke. Well, anyway, if you don't believe me, go ask. Go check how many arbitrators have been sent to jail. I know one, and she didn't even do what they said she did. That was Bradley Christopher Stark, arbitrator. And, oh, by the way, guys, I haven't let Bradley Christopher Stark go. Bradley Christopher Stark is part of the lawsuit. His name is actually in the lawsuit. Okay? All right. What is a click wrap agreement? A click wrap agreement got their name from the shrink wrap agreement, agreements that typically print on a package or software product. Those are shrink wrap where they put the little plastic around a product. And then when you open it up, they have the terms and conditions on the inside. That's called a shrink wrap. When you open up the package, it is presumed you read it. So you don't have to do nothing. Just opening up the package makes you part of that agreement. It's called shrink wrap. Shrink wrap agreement. The other one is click wrap agreement. When you click on a website, click on a link, you are agreeing to the terms and conditions of the website. We didn't do that to be shy. We did that so that we can be in line with everybody else. That's why you see what every email Every email that we send out, it has our agreement attached to it. Gives you the same rules as everybody else. Oh, by the way, we've never, ever gone after nobody with our agreement, with the exception of the two individuals that I've had to explain that we will be going after them. One, one person told me, bring it. So I'm under obligation to, um, let me see, how did he put it? Bring it. I, I don't know why he would ask. Of that I really don't I for the life of me out of all the people on the planet I don't know why he would try to provoke me but oh well life goes on okay so that's just so that you guys are aware of that shrink wrap click wrap that's that's the norm for business every business out there and if you have a website and you don't have that attached to your website then yeah but arbitration agreements help settle a whole lot of stupidity and ignorance. 
because there is a lot of disagreements out there, a lot of conflicts, a lot of controversy. And so this helps to minimize conflicts and controversy. Ta-da! So there you go. All right. Now that we have that taken care of, let's get back to the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation is, is I have been putting out quite a bit of information as of late, information that is definitely helpful to people. Go and look at the lesson series I did this weekend. It shows you exactly what you need to do. All you need to do is pay attention to the information being given. It tells you exactly how to get your credit. Then I did two more videos to follow up on those four videos, and there you go. All you got to do is first understand you have the right. So let's make sure you guys understand you have the right. And then I'm going to bring this to a close. We're going to go to IRS tax topic. T O P I T 453. Yeah, I kind of made that popular. And we're going to click on the one from the IRS. The other websites will put up, uh, which, which one is it? Not that one. There's one website that comes up all the time, and it's really irritating that they pop up first. Oh, by the way, pay attention. 166. You see, 453 and 166, they do go hand in hand. Okay? They do go hand in hand. But we're going to go, even this one's tax topic. You cannot deduct a partially worthless non-business bad debt. You can't. That's why it's got to be a business bad debt. That They're telling you all the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now, let's get this cleared up so that you guys understand it. If you lend money to a relative or a friend with the understanding that they ain't going to pay you back, then you must consider that to have been a gift. <laughs> okay? Because you, you ain't got nothing coming. Okay? However, if you didn't lend them the money as a gift, you lend them the money as a loan, then if someone owes you money and you can't collect, you have a bad debt. Just that simple. There, there's no other way around it. A debt becomes worthless. You want a wholly worthless debt, not, not a, just a worthless debt. You want a wholly worthless debt, meaning the whole thing is you ain't going to be paid. When the surrounding facts and circumstances, who determines what the surrounding facts and circumstances you do? Indicate that there is no reasonable expectation that the debt will be repaid. Well, the facts and circumstances is they are in default now, ladies and gentlemen. They are in default, and you'll see they responded. Sure enough, Shogun, because they think they're smarter, and we'll talk about it in a minute. To show that the debt is worthless, you must establish that you have taken reasonable steps to collect the debt. I filed a lawsuit. Isn't that reasonable? You guys joined the lawsuit. Isn't that reasonable? It is not necessary to go to court, but I want the court. If you can show that a judgment from a court would be uncollectible, the court will never, ever rule against the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve controls the court. You may take a deduction only in the year the debt becomes worthless. Now, hold on now. Hold on now. This is what they do. They'll give you this statement right here, and they won't tell you what the exception is. So whenever you see a statement that's definitive, you can only do this. And it says only, then you ask, what is the exception? So watch this. Oh, and you don't have to wait until the debt is due to determine its worthlessness. You can determine a debt is worthless two days after it becomes due. Okay? Or two days, a year, a whole century before it becomes due. Give me a second, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to put in this statement. I copied it, and we're going to put it in NOI, chat GPT. And we're going to find out what this statement actually reference for, 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 says. says. So give me one second. All right, let's see what he has to say. Hey, hey, this hey! This statement refers to the tax treatment of bad debts debt under, under U.S. US tax, tax law. Specifically, it means it that means a taxpayer, taxpayer can, can only claim, claim a deduction, a deduction for, for a bad, bad debt on their, on their tax, tax return. return. In the In year, year that the debt, debt is determined, determined to be entirely, entirely worthless and uncollectible. The IRS, the IRS generally, generally requires clear evidence, evidence that the debt, that the debt has, has no value, value and that and all reasonable, reasonable efforts to collect the debt have been exhausted 
before, before the, the now watch this wake up wake up I don't need any more nuances, and I definitely don't want your clarifications anymore. Is that understood? Question mark. You said that a person is required to take the deduction in a year it became worthless, comma, you are a liar, comma, they can carry that debt forward or they can carry it backwards. It's called a carry forward or a carry back credit, you moron. Stop listening. You all need to peep game because I just gave you game. When you have a bad debt under this situation, you can carry it forward or carry it backward. Thank you for your correction. If you have any further questions, I will respond directly without any additional explanation. Because he said you just tapped my anus and I don't appreciate that. We ain't football players. And I didn't tap it. I was getting ready to kick it if he came at me with this stupidity again. Ladies and gentlemen, carry forward and carry back is how you don't have to take that worthless debt and do it in the year that it became worthless. That's the part they don't tell you. Okay, let's go to the next section. There are two kinds of bad debt, business and non-business. We don't care about non-business. We're not messing with non-business. You can't do nothing with non-business. Those of you who haven't changed your accounting methods to the accrual method, learn the accrual method. Ask somebody to teach you the accrual method in an easy fashion. Watch this. I need you to explain to me the accrual method as if I was a 10-year-old young lady just learning math. Wake up. I need you to explain to me the accrual method as if I was a 10-year-old young lady just learning math. Stop listening. No. You notice it's short and sweet. The accrual, the accrual method, method of accounting, accounting is like keeping track, track of what you earn and what, what you owe, even if even you if haven't you actually received, received the money or paid the bill yet. yet. Imagine, Imagine you have, you a, have lemonade a lemonade stand. stand. If you if sell you lemonade, lemonade to a friend, friend but, they but they say they'll, they'll pay, you pay you next week, week. With, the with the accrual method, method you, would you would still write down that you earned money today, even though you haven't received it yet. The same goes for expenses. If you, if buy, you lemons, buy lemons but don't, but don't pay, for pay for them until, until next week, week you, still you still write down, down that you owe money, money today. today. So in so simple, simple terms, terms, earning money, money. Write, it write it down when you when make, you the, make sale, the sale, not when not you get, when the, you the, get money. the money. Owing, Owing money. money. Write, it write it down when you, down when you buy something, something. Not, not when you when pay for it. For it. This way, this way, you always know exactly how much you earn and how much you owe, even if the money hasn't actually changed hands yet. So, do you guys understand what he's saying? I understood what he said, but some of you may not have gotten it right away. So pay attention. Short and sweet. Let's, Let's make, it, make simpler. it simpler. Imagine, Imagine you have you a notebook, have a notebook where, you where you keep track, track of, your of your money. One, One when you when sell, you sell something, something, like lemonade, you write, you write down, down that you've earned, earned money, money, even if, even you, if don't you don't get the money, get the money right, right away. away. That's the debt. Two, Two when, you when you buy something, something like lemon, lemon you write, you write down, down that you, that you owe money, money, even if you even don't, if you pay, don't for pay for it right, right away. away. That's the credit. The accrual, the accrual method, method is just a way of writing, writing things down, down when they, when they happen, 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 not when the money, money actually moves. moves. Is that is clear? That clear? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, what he's saying is that the accrual method is you write down the total transaction. So let's say you pay for something today, like at Amazon. You pay for something at Amazon today. And Amazon doesn't deliver it to you until next week, but your account has already been debited. So it's as if you've already received it because the money's already been taken out of the account. That's the accrual method. You do it every day and you don't even realize it. So you do the 3114, 3115 form. So watch this. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to come back to that. So let's do this. IRS. 
3115. It's an application, y'all. It's about six pages, this application. It even comes with instructions. It's about six pages, y'all. Let's see how many pages. No, it says eight. Got some instructions there, too. One, two, three. Now, some of them you don't have to fill out. Okay, you don't have to fill out everything. There's not a lot of spots for filling things out. Okay? Not a lot of spots. But this is the 3115 form. Guess what this form is for? I know you won't believe it. Application to change the accounting method. Because you cannot do it as a so-called non-business. It has to be done as a business. Now, hold on now. I want y'all to pay attention right up in here in this area right here because we got something we need to talk about, okay? Pay attention to what he's about to say. You an individual corporation, nonprofit organization, exempt, all of that. See that right there? And then you got depreciation, authorization. You don't have to click on every box. You don't have to click on every box. We can go right up here to the top. Where is it? I think they changed this form around a little bit. Where is my cash method and accrual method? I don't see the two. Hmm, where's the cash method and accrual method section? It was right there at the top, letting you know to click on the box for a cash method and accrual method. Oh, well, don't see it. Accounting letter, ruling, or correspondence. No, I don't have none of that. Where is the cash method and accrual method? It used to be two boxes that you clicked on, one for the other, and it would let you know, oh, well, Request change, automatic change, procedures, yes, attach your explanation, because it's my choice. <laughs> I get to change my accounting method. This, I'm the one doing the accounting, mother. Anyway, uh, this document is how you go from cash method to accrual method. Now, look, ladies and gentlemen, if it wasn't that important to go from cash to accrual, then why would they have eight pages of you having to fill out? See, whenever you go to a tax preparer, and if you've ever filled out a Schedule C, your tax preparer has always picked that you're a cash method taxpayer every single time. Now, why would they do that? Wait, hold on. Give me one second. Yeah, I, I always spell it wrong. There it is right there. How did I miss that? What page were you on? Oh, they put it all the way on page four. <laughs> they put it all the way on page four. It used to be on page one. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to be the accrual method. You're going to tell them I'm a cash method taxpayer at present, and I'm going to change to the accrual method. Okay? Just that simple. But, see, before when they had it, Pay attention. When they had it here on page one, it was all right here at the top. You didn't need all those other pages. You just, because I want you to pay attention. This is the one that required the signature. No signature. No signature. Uh-oh, get back over here. We're we talking to you. Get over here. Okay, no signature. No signature. No signature. No signature. <sighs> Uh-oh, still no signature. So why is it that there's no signature on all of these pages down here, but there's a signature right there? Because you're not authorizing this down here. You're definitely authorizing this up here. That's why your signature goes here. This is where you're agreeing. Under penalties of perjury, I declare, I do declare, I tell you. Okay? And they're making sure you understand there's a declaration. Okay, so we were filling out just the first page and ignoring those latter pages. Why? Because this one was carried the signature, letting them know this is what we were trying to do, we were intending on doing. All right, so now that we got that, let me tell you, yes, I'm leaving the page. I don't I fill that out for no reason whatsoever. Okay, business bad debt. That's why you don't want to do a non-business bad debt. You're going to change your method to the accrual method. Generally, a business bad debt is a loss from the worthlessness of a debt that was either created or acquired in a trade or a business that is are closely related to your trade or business before it became totally or partially worthless. A debt is closely related to your trade or business if the primary motive for incurring a debt was business related.
Now, you can deduct it from your Schedule C, 1040. Profit and loss for businesses sole proprietorship or applicable business income tax return, which is, it says or. So I choose to use the 3800. My bad. Now, I'm going to do something for you guys. When you're doing the form, you have to take care of the withholding. So when you're filling out the 1096, you'll have to put the amount that's withheld. In order to take care of the withholding, you're going to have to go back to the lesson series I did this weekend, create the money order, and follow the instructions there for sending that to the appropriate office with the IRS to document the withholding. You have to document the withholding so you are liable for the taxes. So what you're going to do is you're going to do 31% of $400 billion, even though that's not the tax bracket for $400 billion. Now remember, when you complete your first one, you are essentially a billionaire. I'm not joking with you. Hold on. Wake up. Federal credits are dollar for dollar. Stop listening. A tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax liability. Ladies and gentlemen, dollar for dollar. Now they like to say dollar for dollar reduction. But it's not a dollar for dollar reduction because we didn't say tax credit. We said federal credit. Did that on purpose. So let's find out what's the difference. Okay, because this one is a federal tax credit. We're not talking about tax credits. It's only a tax credit when it's being applied to taxes. So give me a second while we ask the idiot. Okay, we, we should start that series. Ask the idiot. Uh, one second. Wake up. What's the difference between a federal credit and a tax credit? Question mark. Stop listening. A federal, federal credit, credit refers, refers to a credit, to a credit issued, issued by the, by the U.S. government, government. Typically, typically in the context, in the context of, tax of tax credits or other, or other financial, financial benefits, benefits provided by federal, by federal programs. programs. These credits, These credits can reduce, reduce the amount of tax owed or, or provide other financial, other financial benefits. benefits. A hack credit, credit, on the other hand, isn't a standard, standard term, term in finance, finance or tax, tax law. law. It might it refer might to refer something, something unofficial, unofficial or, unauthorized. or unauthorized. This stupid thing said a hack credit. I ain't saying nothing about no hack credit, you, you stupid hack. Uh, give me one second. But as long as you guys know a federal credit is different from a tax credit, because the two are not synonymous. He's going to keep it simple again. I can live with that. A federal, a federal credit, credit typically, typically refers, refers to a benefit, to a benefit or, entitlement or entitlement provided by the federal, federal government, government, such as such funding, funding or resources, or resources given, given to individuals, individuals businesses, businesses, or states for various, for various purposes. purposes. This can this include can things, things like federal, federal grants, grants loans, loans, or other, or other forms, forms of financial, financial assistance. assistance. A tax credit, on the other hand, is a specific type of federal credit that directly reduces the amount of tax you owe to the government. If you qualify for a tax credit, it subtracts from your total tax. Okay, now watch this. Did you know that a federal credit... Wake up! Did you know that a federal credit and a tax credit are both valued at dollar for dollar? Question mark. Remember, no nuances? And no clarification. Stop listening. I did that so that he would keep it simple. Yes, both federal credits and tax credits are valued dollar for dollar. Wake up. Can you provide me five case citations supporting that conclusion? Stop listening. Certainly, here's a straightforward statement. Federal credits, including tax credit, are dollar for dollar. I said, 
oh, this thing, it didn't even provide, it didn't even say case citations. Hold on. Wake up. Wake up. Five case citations. Case citations. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the AI system messing with things. Okay. Let me get him to do that again. Because he just gave me the case citations without the quote. Give me one second while he gives me the quote. Now, hold on. I'm not going to read this. Hold on. Not going to read it. We're going to go to perplexity. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to tell you something, and I've been noticing it, and I've been noticing it for about a month now. I don't listen to the radio too much anymore. But when I do listen to the radio, especially lately, I've been listening to the radio. I mean, I am blaring my speakers because that's the way I used to drive. Well, anyway, I was listening to All Cried Out, and this version was the 112 and SWV version or whoever it is they were singing with. And while listening to it, All Cried Out, the original Lisa Lisa and Coat Jam, um, listening to it, I played it several times yesterday. And that song's been in my head all day, and a couple other songs have been doing that. But I played it yesterday, and the song is still stuck in my head today. Wasn't stuck in it yesterday, but it is tonight, and I've been noticing that. All right, in this case, the new Colonial Ice Company, uh, in 1934, the Supreme Court addressed the tax implication for a new corporation that took over the assets and businesses of an older corporation. The case revolved around whether the new corporation could deduct net losses, operating losses, from its taxable income despite a change in the corporate identity and ownership. The court ruled that the new corporation was entitled to compute its taxable income by deducting the net loss incurred by the predecessor corporation. They got to write it off. Emphasizing such deductions are subject to specific statutory provisions and regulations. Now hold on. The decision highlighted the principle that tax credits and deductions are crucial in determining tax liability, reinforcing the notion that they can significantly impact a taxpayer's obligation. This and remember, the corporation is a taxpayer. This aligns with the subsequent rulings, such as the commissioner versus Sullivan and deputy versus Depot. Now, what, what happened? Which reiterated that tax credits reduce the tax owed on a dollar-for-dollar dollar basis. These cases collectively underscore the importance of understanding how tax credits function within the framework of federal tax law affirming that they provide direct financial benefits to the taxpayer by lowering their overall burden. This shows you that whenever you get a charge off on your credit report, that means that they received a deduction. They received a benefit. Wake up. Tax credits and federal credits are not synonymous. Tax Stop listening. You are correct. Tax credits and federal credits are not synonymous terms. While all federal tax credits are tax credits, not all tax credits are federal credits. 
tax credits defined. A tax credit is a dollar-for-dollar reduction in the amount of income you owe. Please understand, when you do a 1099-C and you forgive the debt, you're receiving not a tax credit, you're receiving a federal credit because you're forgiving national debt. Ta-da! I am so glad we got that taken care of because there are going to be those people out there who are going to question me as if I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, those are questions I asked. It didn't ask me those questions. I told it what I was asking, and there you see. So please understand, there are three things I know. I know that there are other people out there who are smarter than me. Okay, that's a given. But you know what I know? I know for a fact that there's nobody else out there like me. Now that, that's, that's, that's the two things. And the third thing I know is that I know way more than the many people who are talking about the same subject, and I've never studied this junk. I just know what I know. Now, how do I know what I know? Because I serve a God who I asked, and he gave me knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and discernment. Y'all are going to indulge me for one second. Give me one second. We're going to go right here. Oh, no, you dying. Sorry, there's a rabbit. He's in my yard, and he ain't going to be here very long because they, them and the squirrels, they do a lot of damage, and he's listening to me now. So he he, he gone, I promise you. I, I ain't got no time for no rabbits. Sorry. They do a lot of damage. At first, oh, they're so cute. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Wait till you own property and tell me how cute they are. Oh, I'm sorry. Whew. Woosah. Woosah. We go to Proverbs, ladies and gentlemen. Proverbs. And we go to Proverbs. We're going to go to the third, third, third chapter. And we're going to just do three, one through seven. Normally, I'd stop at five, but we're going to do three, one through seven. My son. My law do not forget, and my commandments may your heart observe, because length of days and years of life and peace will be added to you. May loving kindness and trueness themselves not leave you. Tie them upon your throat. Write them upon the tablet of your heart. Yay. And so find favor. And Good insight. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading the wrong one. <laughs> I knew something was wrong. This is the one. Trust in Joe with all your heart and do not only know your own understanding. In all his ways, take notice of him and he will make your path straight. That's that one. I wasn't supposed to be going. I'm supposed to be going to the second chapter, three through three through seven. I apologize. That's the first chapter. Give me back my second chapter. I apologize, y'all. My son, they both start off the same way. I apologize. My son, if you will receive my sins and treasure up my own commandments within yourself. So I have to pay attention to wisdom with your ear. So I asked him for wisdom. To incline your heart to discernment. I asked him for discernment, to be able to distinguish right from wrong. That's what discernment, discernment means. If moreover you call out for understanding, I asked him for understanding itself, and you give forth your voice to discernment itself, and if you keep Seeking for it as for silver, and you, as for hid treasure, you keep searching for it. In that case, you will understand the fear of Jehovah, and you will find the very knowledge of God. For Jehovah himself gives wisdom, and out of his mouth there is knowledge and discernment. For the upright ones will treasure up practical wisdom. For those walking in integrity, he is a shield by observing the path of judgment. That's the, that's the eighth one. I was only supposed to go to seven. I didn't see the ace. I was looking at the purple and looking at the rabbit in the, he's still there listening to me. He's outside the door, looking at the door, listening to me talk. Like I said, he ain't going, he ain't going to last very long. There are all kind of edibles out there for him to go to 90 night. He he going, he going, he going to go to sleep because this is not, he's a teenager, but he got to go because they, them and the squirrels do too much damage. And I got four vehicles out there. Nah, he got to go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what I can tell you is I'm going to splice these two videos together. They'll be greater than an hour. But I can tell you that there's enough information on here for you all to get your dollar-for-dollar credit. 
Now, hold on now. You keep hearing people say we're supposed to be tax exempt. We're supposed to be tax free. How much better could you be tax free by having $400 billion times 150? I've given you guys all the names of the corporations, given you all the addresses, told you what forms you need to fill out, showed you how to prove that you are part of the case. All you got to do, look, you sent it to the court. That's all you need to do. Let me show you guys something so that you won't bug me no more because y'all, y'all, y'all getting on my last nerve. I told y'all I will update you. Do not email me, text me, or anything trying to find out. This is the tiny home that we purchased. Let me minimize that. Let me see. Where are we? Is it this one? I think it's this one. Oh, no. This is the one I took all the names out. Uh, no. This is not it. I need, oh, this is it. Oh, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, let me show y'all something so, so that y'all can see. That's one person, two person. This is why we told you guys you had to send them in by a certain time because we included it in the lawsuit. So many people were already at it. That's why we just told you guys to sign the document and you'll be at it. This is on the website, ladies and gentlemen. Go watch the last couple of videos that were put up today and you'll see the folder that this is in. Okay, all of you who sent it to the court, don't worry about whether or not the clerk of the court accepted it or not. You just have to keep the letter showing you sent it to the court. Okay, that's all you have to do. Everything else is already taken care of. Like I said, it didn't matter whether or not they accepted it or not, because this is the angle that was going to come about whether we wanted it to or not. We get to document the debt. Yeah, give me, nope, yeah, that was enough to make it move. Uh, he's not doing anything. He's just, he's about to eat some poison. This is for, um, the poison he's about to eat is for insects. So it's not for rodents. It's for insects, and there's a lot of insects. So it's it's been sitting out in the sun for three years now. I bought the bag. And it tore a little bit, so I just laid it on the ground, and I left it there. So it's been rain and snow and sleet and fall and whatever. So he's at that bag. Oh, well, he'll learn his lesson. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've given you all the tools that you need. Everybody keeps talking about, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Eventually, we'll talk about how to take those credits, how to assign those credits. You can start doing your research now how to assign those credits to other entities, how to use those credits to create bonds, promissory notes, get your QCIT numbers for them. Eventually we'll talk about that stuff, but not tonight. I'm tired. I just wanted to get this information out to you guys. So my hope is that putting these two videos together, you'll be more fortified. Now remember, this is going to be well over an hour when I put them together. So, hey, got to go. Take care.